Katalin Miklosi, who is the senior researcher from Alexander Institute here in University of uh, Helsinki. And Dr. Miklosi is, uh, is, uh, is our leading specialist on, on this area and politics that uh, Professor Ag spoke about, especially on Hungary and Romania. So please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I would start with, uh, I will continue on Professor Ag in a moment, but I would start with the exactly the title, Return to uh, the Spheres of Influence. And I was wondering also that when did we actually depart from it? Because the Eastern enlargement of the e European Union uh, uh, was a type of require uh, acquiring a, a sphere of influence or at least an interest area. Uh, the CIS countries, uh, which is uh, in the other name, uh, the Russian Commonwealth uh, is a kind of sphere of influence or not to talk about the, the current uh, issue on the Euro Eurasian uh, uh, Union. Uh, but uh, East Central Europe actually is also a sphere of influence because it means or in, it indicates the eastern part of uh, Central Europe and what Central Europe was or is, it is Middle Europa. So uh, this East Central European region was actually, and it still is, I would argue, uh, a German interest area. Uh, which can be detected also the huge majority of investments and political interests from the German side in this uh, region. But um, I would uh, start with, with a problem that Professor Ag uh, raised, and it is a question of hybrid regimes or hybridization of uh, certain uh, systems. I myself am a historian and actually I, I study uh, the hybridization in a positive sense of state socialist system, uh, which has started already in the 1960s. So hybrid regime, I think uh, the problem that we are dealing with, and uh, uh, in this uh, presentation I would refer uh, hybrid regimes to Russia or China I don't agree with the interpretation that there would be completely dictatorships or authoritarian regimes, no. Uh, as far as I, I understand this, this, these are hybrid systems. And we have a huge problem, problem here. Uh, democracies are evolving, they are changing, they are developing. Now, uh, they can develop uh, in different directions. One direction is the hybridization direction. Now, my question would be also to Professor Ag that if a democratic system is evolving, what is uh, the point of no return when it starts to become a hybrid regime? And, uh, even though that we have the 25th cent, uh, anniversary of the collapse of state socialism or the communist system, we have also 25th century of a book that has been much ridiculed, uh, mostly from my profession, historian's point of view, uh, the end of history, Francis Fukuyama. Uh, I would argue still uh, that Francis Fukuyama hit a point or raised a very important point uh, that he stated that actually uh, the highest level of uh, systemic development is liberal democracy, right? Now, the problem is that we still have deep down this same belief system when we study uh, different regimes uh, especially hybrid regimes. So we have difficulties to understand hybrid regimes because we have this normative attitude, uh, how a regime should be like. So I would argue that uh, we don't understand Russia because we don't understand what hybrid regime uh, stands for. 
Uh, and because of this normative attitude, uh, we have studied Russia ever since electricity was invented. Nevertheless, uh, because of this normative approach, uh, we saw uh, what we wanted to see, not what was out there. So uh, the problem is with normative attitude that it, it blurs our sight or our understanding. Uh, this is why we don't understand and we didn't wake up uh, early enough to, to see how a hybrid regime can be very magnetic also for EU countries like the, how I called the East Central European sphere is the Eastern group of the EU. So it was magnetic, so a Russian model is magnetic. Why? Because it meets the formal criteria of democracy. It has multi-party system, free elections, uh, market economy, uh, civic sphere, uh, goodness sake. Uh, it is almost as uh, the Copenhagen criteria uh, demanded. So uh, the problem, and why is magnetic? Uh, because it is a very stable system. There is nothing, even, even though that you have free elections, there is nothing that would actually threaten Putin's power at the moment. So we still have this explanation that of course, because the people in Russia or in China or anywhere in a hybrid system are manipulated, they are suppressed uh, by a very clever political elite. But if you look at closely, uh, people actually were, I mean, they are willingly trade uh, their freedom, rights, democratic rights for material security. So what does it tell us about how we understand hybrid system? This is about how we didn't understand what has happened after the Arabic Spring. How come when the people can vote, they vote for burqas, right? Sharia law. So we, we, don't, deal, uh, we, we don't do well with dealing with hybrid systems because we don't have a proper uh, communication with them because we don't understand, we don't have the language to communicate with them. We have, I agree that we don't have Cold War syndrome here anymore, but we still have black slashes of Cold War uh, attitude. Because what can we do with Russia? Restrictions. Uh, we have to stand for strong hand policies because this is what we did uh, for during the Cold War, and how, did, how well did this work, actually? It took 40 years, uh, all kind of restrictions and sanctions that brought down, after, after all, the system, right? But uh, back to this problem. Why do we have this problem? Uh, I think also another ridiculed person, Donald Rumsfeld, in 2003, when he came out from the closet and he said that there is an old Europe and a new Europe, a distinction that ran counter uh, against our dominant narrative of a happily ever after unified EU. But actually, Rumsfeld was also right in a sense that new Europe, the new integrated, or this area actually didn't share the, the democratic traditions of, uh, of the old Europe. Never shared because uh, it never had traditions uh, before the communist takeover either. So they didn't know what to do when communism collapsed and all of a sudden you had to build up a completely new democratic system. But the problem was that uh, uh, that they uh, actually didn't have a kind of deep down discussion of what is uh, democracy. Because there was this Copenhagen criteria and uh, 
they uh, were very aware that uh, for transition, for transition only uh, those who followed the the Western European model would uh, be awarded by massive uh, economic aid. Now, I would uh, say that uh, the problem was uh, that democracy uh, and the discussion of democracy was very shallow. It was the question how uh, quickly you could uh, brush up your, your uh, kind of uh, cosmetic democracy uh, in order to get into the EU. So I would argue that uh, the democracies that was speeded up, controlled, and guided by the, the EU were not really democracies, which is why I would also challenge uh, the whole issue that uh, since they were in the first place very formally constructed democratic system, how much uh, hybridization did it take uh, in the end to, 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 to take a step back in this, in this uh, process. So concluding this, this small comments on this issue is uh, that I think we should take a much closer look what hybrid regimes what kind of impact hybrid regimes have on the contemporary development of the EU. Because I also argue that hybridization is already started in the eastern, eastern part of the EU, and we are facing actually Trojan horses. Uh, Trojan horses that the EU seems to be weak to, to handle, to deal with. But the problem with a weak EU is that there are no political vacuums. If the EU is weakened, there is this magnetic uh, Russian model that many, many uh, government, uh, many political elites would be very uh, eager to adopt uh, because these kind of systems are very stable politically. It is not likely that you would lose the next election. So, thank you.